Today, we, I'm so excited, we start a new series. So go with me, if, if you can, please, to the book of Exodus. <clears throat> go with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. And we are going to begin in verses 1 through 8. And so this is such a wonderful story about one of the greatest leaders in the Bible, I think, Besides Jesus, one of the greatest leaders of all time is Moses. What, what, a, what a, uh, a hero he is, what a character he is. But I want to teach us some principles about his life that I believe can be applied to our life. Because we are beginning a new series today called Born for the Moment. Born for the Moment. There are some people... There are, there are some, some characters in the Bible that you just know they were born for that moment, that specific moment. And, and I believe that every person in this place, um, man or woman, a young person, a child, you, you have a purpose in God. There is a purpose for your life. Uh, you're not a mistake we, we, because we don't, uh, we don't serve a God of coincidence. We, we serve an intentional God. Come on, help me. We serve an intentional God. Everything he does, everything he creates is intentional. And every, everything that he, that he uh, designed for a life will be fulfilled. But there's some things we have to do in order to be able to accomplish those things. And we're going to see through the life of Moses some of these things that I believe are going to be able to help us out today. So um, the book of Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 says like this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire. But the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Uh, just... We're going to talk a little bit about what the, how big that significance is. Just mo everyone say Moses. 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 Okay. He said, here I am. Everyone say, here I am. Yeah. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people, and I have heard the cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Habitites, and the Jebusites. Somebody say, help me, Jesus. And so we're going to end right there because I believe there's some good principles. We keep reading. It's just going to be kind of a, a lot for us today. But I want to talk to you about three different principles today. Okay, so those of you who are writing down notes, no, principle number one, uh, God's purpose for my life. Principle number two, God hears me and God sees me. And principle number three, your yes is bigger than you. Okay. So how many are ready today? 
We have a story here of a man named Moses. And I think it behooves us to understand a little bit of a backstory in order to understand the story in which we are in right now. Moses had gone through some things in his life. But I think one of the most significant things that happened in his life was the part where he actually was born. You see, Moses was born in a very chaotic time, a very difficult time. Pharaoh had, at that time, assigned for every child two years and younger that was a male child to be put to death. Yet when his mother saw how beautiful he was. The Bible says he was a beautiful baby. She couldn't do it. She just could not give up his, her child in that moment. One of the reasons why pharaohs would do this and kings would do this is because they were afraid that another leader would rise up and take the position of, of, of royalty or kingship that they had. And so because the people of God were beginning to multiply so greatly, Pharaoh felt threatened by their growth. Cannot tell you that the enemy feels threatened by your growth. I'm going to say it one more time, that whenever you are advancing, that whenever you are starting to go to another level, when your maturity is growing, when you got your emotions in order and they don't make decisions for you anymore, when you stop being a child and you mature, Paul said, Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought of like a child, I behaved like a child, but when I got older, I left the childish things to one side and I began to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, the enemy does not like when you you grow up. The enemy does not like a mature church. The, the enemy doesn't like a church that knows its Bible. The enemy doesn't like a church that doesn't get ran by their feelings. He is threatened by your growth. He, this is why he wants to keep you stuck. This is why he wants to keep you loyal to the wrong things. This is why he wants to keep you assigned to the wrong thing. But I thank God today that the word of of God is growing us up today. I thank God that God is in a business of growing people. We're not just in the business of growing a church. We're in the business of growing people because if we can grow people, we can dominate, we can take over, and we can conquer. Is there anybody ready to grow? Shout amen. The enemy is threatened by your growth. <laughs> So he'll want to keep you ignorant. He'll want to keep you stuck. That's why young people, you've got to go to school, get an education, grow up, stop being emotional, make a decision, any decision at this point, just make a decision, bro. You know, we talked about it a few weeks ago. How many of you are good at making decisions? Raise your hand. You're, you're quick on your feet. Quick on your feet. You're about 60% sure you put the pedal to the metal. Let's go. How many of you need to be about 95 to 110% sure to make a decision? You're right there. How many of you are having a hard time making decision about the question I'm asking you right now? Can you raise your hand? Maybe that, maybe you just have a hard time. Right? I don't know. Is this a trick question? Are we going <laughs> to, I don't know. Yeah. And so, and so the enemy doesn't ever want you to grow up. And so he wants to keep you stuck. So he'll keep you in undecisiveness because your undecisiveness is a decision. You've decided to stay stuck and grow. It's to get stuck and not grow. But how many of you are grateful that you're at a place where they're going to teach you how to grow, man? You're going to grow up. You're going to make some decisions. You're going to teach you how to make hard decisions. And when you decide, then God, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave that right there. So Pharaoh was threatened. We got to get to the story. The Pharaoh was threatened by the growth. So he decides, I'm going to kill off all the, all the male childs. But, but, but because when God has a purpose for you, when God has a plan for your life, number one, God's purpose is greater than Pharaoh attack. Let's say it one more time. Number one, God's purpose for your life is greater than any attack the enemy can bring. I'm going to say it for the third time. The people in the back, you're hanging out. God's plan 
God's purpose, God's promises, God's word over your life is greater, bigger, stronger than any attack that any devil, any pharaoh, or any hater can bring into your life. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You ought to shout because no matter what happens to you, what happens to around you, it'll never touch you because God's plan is greater than the devil's attack. Look at what Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 19 says. You ready for this? This is a promise for your life. Okay. It says like this, Jeremiah 1 19, they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. They will fight you. They don't want you to grow. They don't want you to start a business. They don't want you, they don't want you to elevate to the next level. They don't want you to get the promotion. They don't, they don't, they don't want you, they don't want to see you succeed. But the Bible says that they will fight you. They will fight God's promises. The enemy will fight God's promises in your life. But the Bible promises that when they fight you, they will not overcome you. For I am with you to deliver you. And then he signs the letter. He signs the deed. And he says, it is I who said this. So no matter what comes into your life, no matter how desperate things get, the Bible teaches us as they will fight you. They will fight you. Think, the enemy will fight you. People who, 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 who perhaps have, have, have talked bad about you will fight you. But you have to understand the promise of God over your life is that they will not overcome you because God will deliver you. Are you grateful for God's promises? So God's, say with me, God's purpose is greater than any attack. I feel like you got to tell two or three people next to you, if it's okay, just say God's purpose in your life is greater than any attack. That, that was the wrong neighbor. Choose the other neighbor, the other one, the other one. God's purpose is greater than any attack. It, it, God's purpose is greater than any sickness. God's purpose is greater than any mental attack. God's purpose is greater than any, any spiritual attack. God's purpose is greater than any financial attack because God has promised that you will be delivered. Number two, the Bible teaches us and it says that as as. As Moses was born, his mother saw him beautiful. Now, I want, you, I want to take you through the story because this is amazing. For some of you who don't know his story, his mother puts him in a little basket. Can you imagine the pain, the hurt, the insecurity, the, the, the stress, the depression, the anxiety the mother felt having to put her three-month born child in a basket in a river and then have to walk away. Now, I get, I get nervous when my kids go to the front yard. Because they, pe times are not like they were before. Right? You'd get home from school, drop the backpack, change the shoes. My dad's like, you better, you better change the shoes. You got, your, you got your school shoes, and then you got your, your dirty shoes. This is, he's always been a shoe guy, my dad. I got that from him. It's his fault. <laughs> and, and, and you go out, you get in your bike, had one rule. I had one rule. Be home before the lights turn on. Those lights turn on, you're not home. Choose the belt, whichever belt you want, but we're going to dance. We are going to dance when you get home. You know what I'm talking about? They'd make you dance. Like, yeah, 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 right? <laughs> oh, you learned. That's, that's where I got my moves. I got my moves because <laughs> we're going to dance, right? And, quita la mano. Quita la mano. Quita la mano. Some of you don't know. Take your hand because we, we would put our hand. We try to get the hand off. Get the hand off. Take the hand off. 
Woo, don't leave me out of here by myself. And so, what are we talking about? Moses. Okay, got you. I got you. And so, and so she, she sends off little Mo on a little boat. And she has to come home with the pain and, and, and hopes that a miracle could happen and somehow he'd be all right. God, I don't, I, I don't, I just, I couldn't take his life, so I'm going to leave it up to you, God. And there's something about entrusting God with the, with the things that he's given you. And she releases the one thing that was dear to her heart to, because, because Moses had, had another brother. Moses had a sister. But there was something special about Mo. And so Moses gets sent off. And the Bible says that, that Miriam, his sister, was hiding behind a bush and just kind of looking like, oh, man, my little brother, man. A little, see, because she could be out there, but any male couldn't be out there. And so she's out there, and all of a sudden she sees that, as, that the river starts taking Mo into, the, into Egypt, into, into the palace. And, and as, as they're getting closer to the palace, Pharaoh's daughter comes and she's bathing. And here comes the little miracle close to Pharaoh's daughter. And when she sees the baby, she knows there's an assignment from Pharaoh that any male child that age has to die. But there was something special about Moses that when she looked at him, she says, I can't follow my father's law. I cannot, I, I cannot follow the things that, the plan that he has for Mo. I, he, I can't do that because there's something about him that I love. So I'm going to take him for me. So she takes little Moses and she goes up to the palace and she says to her father, look how beautiful he is, dad. Can I keep him? Can I keep him? And all of a sudden, Pharaoh, something tugs at Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh says, all right, you can keep that one. Go ahead and keep that one. And then I'm going to go through the story really quick. And then the maiden comes in. And she sees that, that, that Pharaoh's daughter has a new baby. And he's a little, he's a little browner. He's, he's, he's a little darker skin. So she understands uh, this ain't an Egyptian. This, 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 is a, uh, this is a Hebrew boy. I, I, can, I can tell the features. But more than that, what, what, what the story didn't tell us at first was that the maiden was actually Miriam, Moses' sister. So as Miriam is walking, seeing the the baby all the, get all the way to Pharaoh's home. Now her heart starts, wants to come out of her chest because she said, this must be the death of Moses. But all of a sudden there is something about Moses that his life was preserved. And now Miriam, his sister, says to, the, to Pharaoh's daughter, would you... Uh, do you need some help with the baby? Should I have one of the Hebrew ladies come nurse him for you? And, and Pharaoh's daughter says, that, that's a great idea. Go get me a Hebrew woman to nurse this, this baby boy. So Miriam comes home. Mama! Mama! I found Mo. What do you mean? He's at the palace and they want you to raise him. Because God's plan for your life will interrupt every scheme of the enemy over your children, over your generations. My God, I feel God's presence. I'm telling you God's purpose, God's plan will interrupt every attack over your generations, over your children, because God has a purpose. Come on, is there anybody glad that God will interrupt the plan of the devil? 
So Moses, so now mom, mom comes in and she nurses her own son for two years. Woo! Pharaoh's daughter had no idea that was mom. Can you imagine the joy? But see, all of this happened for one reason. Because there was going to come a time where he was going to have a burning bush encounter with the same God that interrupted the devil's plan. Can, can I challenge you today? I got a lot of notes, but I just want to challenge you today. I want to let you know that everything that has preserved your life, every step that you've taken, every moment that you've experienced where you've seen the hand of God, those moments where you, see, where you say, had it not been for God, had it not been for his grace, I don't know how I would be here if it had not been I'm letting you know right now it was for one reason it was because there was going to be a burning bush encounter with that same living God because his people God's people were under slavery for over 400 years. Some scholars said it was like 645 years. I started reading and I said, okay, this is too complicated. 400 years is a lot. Or is 645, whatever it is you, whatever theological belief you believe, it's all good. I'm not here to argue that. I'm just here to argue that they were enslaved for a very long time. And one day... God hears the cry of his people. Can I, can, I, can I give you number two? God hears you and God sees you. I know it's a simple statement. I know it's a simple principle. But have you ever felt overlooked? Have you ever felt as though you're talking to a wall? You, you've, ever, you've ever encountered people when you're talking to them? You, you feel like you're talking to a wall. That you're talking to them, they're on their phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe your kids, 14, 15, 13 years old. You listen to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have, but have you ever felt overlooked? Have you ever felt, does anybody even, does anybody even care? It's been way too long with this situation. It's been, it's, it's been years with this. It's the same cycle over. It's the same addiction over. It's the same place over. Am I, will I ever get set free? Will I, ever, will I ever grow up? Will I ever mature? I keep making the same mistake over and over and over. And, and, and it seems as if I, I just can't get past this sin. I can't get past this situation. I can't get past this thing. Can I tell you that? day God hears you and God sees you and every promise that is delayed it doesn't mean it's denied oh I feel I feel like there's somebody has to you have to understand that that although the promise is delayed it's not denied and so 430 years pass or 645 years pass and God's people, the Pharaoh who was first there, he dies. And when he dies, the people thought, surely after he dies, we'll get freedom. But long behold, another Pharaoh came up and this guy was worse. And oh, now the people are saying, we thought we'd have freedom. But there's no one that could save us. There is no one that can intercede for us. There is no one that can help us. But behold, God was preparing a man named Moses from the time he was born. He preserved his life. He provided for his life. Why? For one moment. Because there was going to come a moment in his life where he was going to have to step into the stage of humanity and say, enough is enough today is the day that my people will get set free and God said I have heard the cry of my people I have heard the cry of my community I have heard the cry of your family I have heard the cry of the of the Rocha family I've heard the cry of the Gutierrez family I have heard the cry and today is the day Moses you will rise to the occasion can I, 
Can I share with you today that, that everything that has preserved your life has been because there will come a moment where you must step to the stage of time and say enough is enough. Could it be that today God is saying you're, you're that Moses in your family? You're that, you're that person that's going to change the trajectory of the generational curse of slavery and bondage and alcohol and drug addiction and, and, and pornography and, and divorce and, and, and all these other generational and fear and anxiety and depression. Well, my, my father dealt depression, so I'm going to deal with depression and anxiety. No, could it be that it's you, that it's you, that you're the Moses that's going to stand before the stage of your family and say, today's the day I'm going to get educated. I'm going to get equipped. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into the the realm of prayer. Why? Because God is, is, is assigning me to this. God sees you. God hears you. God listens to your cry. You were born for this moment. Can I dare to say that some, some of us should have been statistics? If you grew up without a father, if you grew up in a, in, in, in a broken home, if you grew up without a mother, if you, you, there are statistics that you should have fell under according to the things of the world. It's interesting because like my wife, she, she's a teacher. She's the most prettiest, beautiful teacher on the planet. I wish I, I wish I was a fourth grader. Such as I really. And, and I, I remember my wife coming home one day and I asked her a question. I said, <clears throat> we, were, we were talking about children and then she says, you know, you know what's funny? She says, I can tell what kids come from broken homes without them telling me by the way they behave sometimes. Psychological reactions, behaviors, triggers. And, she, and most teachers would just get frustrated and, but I know what they really need is a hug. I know what they need, really need is that before they walk in, she don't do, she, she, I don't know if I'm exposing you or not, baby, but she's like, she's like anointing every, every chair. They're having little prayer meetings with a couple of teachers. Hey, let's come on. Let's, let's pray. And they hold hands and Lord, every child that comes in here, God, I bind the enemy every trauma everything happening at home we break the bondage of sin over them we anoint this classroom you see because we're not we're not battling them we're, we're battling the, the spirits we're battling the things that they're dealing with but could it be that it's you in that workplace could it be that it's you in the you know you know that guy that gets on your nerves at the warehouse that's just like he's just like man he's on your last nerve bro he's just he's just always talking he's just oh you know that guy in that job site that's just like yeah, you, you what you don't understand and you might see that, that it, it seems like he's arrogant but he's really hurting he's really broken and God is saying I have heard the cry and I'm sending you to stand on the, in the gap of this moment and say, hey man, you don't have to be that way here. There's a God who loves you. Because Moses isn't coming back down anymore. But I believe that we have an assignment from the Lord. That everything you have experienced, good or bad, good or bad, because God does not waste a pain. He does not waste a hurt. He does not waste a disappointment. 
God does not waste a bad situation. No, he will teach you through it. He will grow you through it. Growth hurts, but so does staying stuck. So you will have to endure the pain of growth or the pain of being stuck, but it's gonna hurt one way or another. I don't know about you, I'd rather heed to God's call and say, God, grow me, God, teach me, so that I can step into that situation and say, I have what you need to set you free. Look at what, look what the Bible says in, in the book of Psalms. Psalms 34, I believe it's 34, 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all of my fears. I, I looked for God. He says, I looked for him. I had an encounter with God. And when I had an encounter with God, he delivered me from all of my fears. And I love that it says fears, not fear. There's an S. Because fear can be driven from so many things, past traumas. It could be from somebody disappointing you or, or just fear of the future, the unknown. He said, it doesn't matter. When, when I had an encounter with God, he delivered me from my past. He delivered me from my present. And he delivered me from my future. So when I cried out to him, because God hears you and God sees you. And when, he, and, when you, and when you respond to God's call, he says, I'm going to heal your past. I'm going to heal your present. And I'm going to heal your, heal your future. I cried to the Lord and he delivered me. He healed me from all of my fears. He hears you. He sees you. Even when you feel overlooked. And number three, I'm going to end here. Your yes is bigger than you. Say with me, my yes is bigger than me. Moses' yes was not just for him, but there was a million people that were in bondage. So his yes was so much bigger than him. Can I challenge you today that everything that has happened in your life has brought you to this moment, this stage, this place? Because one yes, listen to me by the Holy Spirit, one yes can literally change generations in your life. One yes to God doesn't just change your life. It changes your children's life. It changes your grandchildren's life. It changes your great-grandchildren's life. Your yes is bigger than right now. Your yes is generational. Your yes goes beyond your years. Your yes goes beyond your age. I believe that the generational God is waiting for a generational yes from you to say, today is the day I say yes and I change generations. Can you stand with me today, please? Your yes is bigger than you because you were born, you were preserved, and you were alive for this moment right here, right now, where you can have an encounter with God, a burning bush encounter, a holy encounter that doesn't just set you free. It sets generations free they were in slavery for 400 years they were in bondage for over 400 years and one yes from Moses activated the power miracle working God in his life did you hear what I said
430 years and one yes changed and activated the power and the miracle working God in his life one yes from you one yes to God one yes right now can change everything listen one yes right now can change everything one yes to a miracle working God. God, I don't even know how I'm supposed to do this. I can't even talk about all the, all the imperfections Moses had. You know why he fled Egypt? He had killed a man. And Pharaoh was after him and so he was hiding the whole time. Forty years had gone by. And after the 40 years, God calls him. Man, I feel from the Holy Spirit to say this to somebody right now. 40 years passed before God called him. There's somebody here saying, is it too late, God? Did I miss it? Did I miss my chance? If God called Moses 40 years later, I'm telling you, you didn't miss it. You're right on time. You're right where you need to be. Because in God's time, you're at the right time. Did you hear what I said, baby? In God's time, you're at the right. It didn't happen when you wanted it to happen. You didn't want, you didn't happen when you thought it was going to happen. But in God's time, it was the right time. You didn't miss it. God's waiting for a yes from you. So in the next, next few minutes that I have, I just want to minister to you. What stage is God asking you to, to step into? You were born for this moment. You were born for this. You were preserved. God provided for you. Some of you, you should have gone crazy. You should have been in a madhouse. Some of you, you the moment you, you said yes, it broke all of that off of you. Because God preserved your life. Please close your eyes where you are right now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, God. For your word. Teach us your word that we may walk in it. So right now, to every person that is saying, man, that, that's, that's for me. God is asking me. God has shown himself strong to me. God's, I could hear God telling me I have a purpose and a plan for your life. Now I understand why the enemy was attacking me so much. Can you believe how valuable you are? That the enemy and God are both fighting for your soul. But today, God showed you there's a purpose and I'm going to interrupt every plan. God reminds you, I hear you and I see you. And today, somebody needs to say yes to God. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to count to three. Listen, I'm going to count to three. And if you need that burning bush experience where God says, man, this is the moment. This is the moment you were waiting. I, I made everything happen for this one moment right here. It's time to make a decision. It's time to step into the newness of God. It's time to step into what God has for you. Enough is enough. It's been enough excuses. It's been enough reasons why not. I'm giving you the biggest reason why you should. I love you. I see you. I hear you. And I'm calling you. So I'm going to count to three. And you're going to come up to this altar right here. And we're going to lift our hands and we're going to pray for you and you're going to say yes to God. Ready? Are you ready to receive God's promises? Are you ready to activate the miracle working God in your life? Ready? One, two, three. Grab your family. Grab your friends. Come to this altar now.